Good afternoon, everyone. And as attendees are uh, being let into the session, we will get to our introductions very shortly. Welcome. Right, I think we can get started. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Office for the Advancement of Research's second uh, book talk for the spring 2021 semester. Uh, our talk today is featuring uh, our own Professor Leila Kazamian, who's a professor of sociology at John Jay College and a faculty member in the PhD program in criminal justice here. She's a graduate of the Université de Montreal. Montreal. How's that, Leila? Uh, she earned her PhD at the Institute of Criminology of the University of Cambridge in 2005 and was awarded a one-year postdoctoral fellowship by the UK Economic and Social Research Council. She joined John Jay's faculty in the fall of 2006 and was promoted to the rank of full professor last year in 2020. Her research interests include desistance from crime, long-term incarceration, prisoner reintegration, life course and criminal career research and comparative criminology. Dr. Kazamian's prior work has been published in Criminology and Public Policy, the Journal of Research in Crime and Delinquency, the Journal of Quantitative Criminology, Punishment in Society, the European Journal of Criminology and the Journal of Interpersonal Violence. We are here today to discuss Layla's 2020 book, Positive Growth and Redemption in Prison, Finding Light Behind Bars and Beyond which addresses the lack of criminological research documenting the psychological, social, and behavioral changes that occur during periods of incarceration. Drawing on original, an original longitudinal study of long-term French prisoners, the book examines the process of desistance from crime and positive growth in prison, and offers reflections on how personal transformation can be achieved among individuals serving long prison sentences. And it is my great honor today to introduce also uh, Layla's discussant for this book talk. Jeremy Travis is present, President Emeritus of John Jay College, which he led for 13 years as its fourth president from 2004 to 2017. Jeremy is currently the Executive Vice President of Criminal Justice at Arnold Ventures, where he leads a team that is implementing reform strategies focused on policing, pretrial justice, community supervision, prisons, and reintegration. Jeremy's storied career in public service has included stints as senior fellow at the Urban Institute's Justice Policy Center, director of the National Institute of Justice under Attorney General Janet Reno, deputy commissioner for legal matters for the NYPD, special advisor to NYC Mayor Ed Koch, and clerk to then US Court of Appeals Judge Ruth Bader Ginsburg. His accomplishments during his time as John Jay's president are likely well known to many in the audience. Uh, but highlights include overseeing the design and construction of the college's award-winning new building, which I know many of us miss very much, uh, co-founding research centers, including our Institute for Justice and Opportunity, formerly the Prisoner Reentry Institute, and our Data Collaborative for Justice, formerly the Misdemeanor Justice Project, and the creation of the college's Office for the Advancement of Research, uh, which is the sponsor of today's event. He's the author of But They All Come Back, Facing the Challenges of Prisoner Reentry, and most recently chaired the panel of the National Research Council that produced the landmark report, The Growth of Incarceration in the United States, Exploring Causes and Consequences, the volume which he co-edited. And uh, very much, Jeremy is very much responsible for my being at John Jay College. So great honor to introduce him today. Um, Layla. Thank you so much, Dan. Um, thank you to the Office for Advancement of Research for putting this together. Thank you to all of you for being here and a special thanks to Jeremy for taking time out of his busy schedule to be here with us today. I'm really delighted to be here to talk about my research with long-term prisoners. This is a topic that I've been really passionate about for uh, many years now. Um, this is research that was conducted in France, but it bears relevance for any cultural context, really. And I really didn't want this to be another piece of research that just highlighted the negative consequences of incarceration. I feel like by now this is an empirical fact. There's ample evidence to demonstrate this. 
the National Research Council report um, that, that uh, Dan just mentioned, which was chaired by Jeremy and Bruce Western, is a major piece on this issue. And so we need to be realistic. The institution of prison is not going anywhere anytime soon. We're not going to go from having nearly 2 million prisoners to zero prisoners overnight. So the question of, of understanding how people can grow and thrive and make progress towards desistance from crime while they're incarcerated is particularly important. So I'm just going to share my screen. So we actually know relatively little about the changes that occur uh, over periods of incarceration. Life course and criminal career research has largely failed to examine how offending patterns change while people are incarcerated. Uh, we tend to control, in our estimates of offending, we tend to control for periods of incarceration. And uh, it's based on the assumption that people are not committing crime while they're on the inside. Um, and actually there are a lot of changes that occur while people are on the inside. We've just, uh, we don't necessarily always have the access uh, to measure this. And this is particularly true for long-term prisoners and individuals serving life sentences. Um, they really are the forgotten prisoners. They tend to be overlooked by theory, uh, policy and practice. And so these are some of the ideas that prompted this, this research study, which began in 2013. Um, in a, in a correctional facility right outside of Paris, uh, conducted 58 interviews with, with the prisoners who volunteered for the study then, and I followed up in 2016 with interviews with a, a sample of 50 men. So when I met with them again, some were still in the original facility, others had been moved to a different facility, so I engaged in some correctional tourism and visited uh, prisons all over the country. Some had been released, so I met with them in the community, and others had been released and reincarcerated. So these were males that had been regarded as being particularly serious offenders. Their crimes um, had, had attracted a lot of uh, media attention for some of them. And the sample of males was representative of the facility, but the facility itself um, had, uh, the, the prisoners in that facility had more at-risk profiles than prisons in France. So in a sense, this is an oversampling of, um, of individuals who are regarded as being particularly at risk. The study drew on the phenomenological approach, which examines how individuals make sense of their life experiences, and also the mixed methods approach. So I used both survey and interview methods. This was really useful because as those of you who do qualitative research know, when you do uh, interviews, you never know the direction in which the interview is going to go. Um, the participant might decide to take it in a completely different direction than what you had planned. So the value of having survey data is that the same questions were asked to everyone. So there was this baseline information um, that was collected for everybody in, in the study. The sample size in this research was initially supposed to be much larger than this, but uh, due to administrative delays, I ended up having the sample of 50, uh, 50 some men. And actually in retrospect, this ended up being a blessing in disguise because I conducted all the interviews myself. So I remembered everyone. I remembered their, their life stories. I remembered their triggers. And so we were able to um, establish a rapport of trust. And even from the beginning, when I met them and I explained to them that I was a researcher, that I didn't work for the correctional administration um, already uh, right off the bat, because I have a French Canadian accent, they already knew that I didn't work for the administration. The ongoing joke was that the administration would never hire somebody with such a ridiculous accent. Um, and so we were able to have a good rapport from the beginning um, and then and, and my follow up with them. And the fact that I did all the interviews myself really put me in a privileged position to track their progress and their evolution and also to identify inconsistencies in their discourse and to call them out on it when, uh, when appropriate. So just to give you a little bit of a sense of um, who, who the, the, the study participants were. Their age ranged between 18 and 68 years old. Um, about a third of the sample had foreign born parents. Um, over three quarters of the offenses involved some loss of life, either homicide or murder um, or terrorism. There were two cases of terrorism in the study. Um, so a quarter of the sample were sentenced to life. 
half had spent some time in prison prior to this current incarceration, and uh, almost three quarters of the sample had spent uh, more than 10 years of their lives in prison. And so just to give you a little bit of a sense of the different measures that are that were included in the surveys, which were very comprehensive, the interviews when participants were not that chatty lasted about an hour and a half. Um, when people had a lot more to say, of course, we had to meet on several occasions. And so we're not going to cover all of this today, but it's to give you a sense of, of really how uh, broad and comprehensive the data collection was. So desistance from crime was the main theme of the research, which is broadly defined as the process of giving up criminal behavior. And this is based on the premise that people are capable of change, you know, regardless of what they've done, that people are always capable of evolution and change and progress. And so through the narratives of the men, it became obvious that desistance from crime entails a conscious commitment to abandon offending behavior first, and second, to change the attitudes and behaviors that cause intentional harm to oneself and to others. And so when I refer to the concept of positive growth, I'm referring to this, this um, series of cognitive and emotional changes that reduce individual suffering and that promote a shift away from crime and also other harmful behaviors. So I'm going to, of course, not go over everything, um, but I will present some of the more salient findings from, uh, from the research. So I think the first uh, important finding to emerge from this study is that the root cause of sustained violence is unresolved trauma and suffering. Dr. Gabor Mate, who does work on addiction, um, talks about how the appropriate question is not why the addiction, but why the pain? And so sometimes individuals turn harm inward in the form of self-harm or depression or addiction, and other times they turn the harm outward in the form of aggression and violence and crime. And it's as a society and especially as criminologists, we just happen to be more concerned with the outward uh, expression of emotional distress, but both forms stem from the same source. So what became really clear from the narratives is that a person cannot be in a good place emotionally, mentally, and willfully inflict harm onto others. These two things are just fundamentally incompatible. And so this has a lot to do with their, uh, the prior trauma and adversity that they experienced even, even before uh, coming to prison. So you can see here, I used for this uh, Kathy Widdham's Lifetime Trauma and Victimization History Survey. So we see that there's a high prevalence of, of individuals who are in foster care in childhood, over a third of the sample. The entire sample uh, reported at least one traumatic experience. So, um, and remember this is even before they've ever stepped foot inside of a prison. This is all experiences that occurred outside of prison. On average, they had experienced eight different types of uh, victimization incidents. So this is the variety, not the frequency. So they may have experienced many incidents of each type. And about a third of the sample had been victim of coerced sexual acts or attempted um, coerced sexual acts. And one of the recurring themes in the, one of the recurring themes in the narratives of the men was the lack of adequate mental health support to cope with past trauma. So, um, have the example of a 60 some year old participant who was describing an incident of abuse that he endured when he was four or five years old. So we're talking six decades in the past and he was shedding fresh tears as though the incident had happened the prior week. So it's, um, and, and when he tried to speak to the psychologist about it, um, the conversations were really more focused around, well, how are you keeping busy? How are you filling your days, et cetera, instead of trying to um, address these issues. It, he also had committed very violent crimes and there was really um, minimal effort to try to get to the core of that. A second important finding um, is the idea that prison misconduct is not always an accurate indicator of risk. So given the restrictive nature of the prison environment, rule-breaking behavior tends to be ubiquitous. And it doesn't necessarily reflect risks of recidivism, and it's not necessarily the best indicator of progress towards desistance from crime. So in the sample, 90% of individuals had engaged in some form of rule-breaking behavior at some point. 
um, and over 50% actually had engaged in violent misconduct, which often involved um, altercations with other prisoners. So it was more of a situational violence rather than being a result of a stable underlying trait. But most importantly, the circumstances of the rule breaking behaviors are really important. So there, there were a number of cases where um, individuals had smuggled in a, a cell phone so that they might be able to keep contact with their family members. Um, there was another instance, a participant who told me that he had been sanctioned because he had a, a USB drive with a software that he was trying to learn so that he might be more competitive on the job market when, uh, when he got out. So individuals who engaged in the desistance narrative, it's not that they were not engaging in, in, in uh, rule breaking behavior, but the rule breaking behavior served a utilitarian purpose that would eventually benefit their reintegration. It wasn't just breaking the rules for breaking the rules. I think part of the, res the, the results that I find the most fascinating are uh, the part where I explored what a desistance narrative in prison looks like. What are the features of somebody who engages in sort of this commitment to give up criminal behavior? Um, prisoners are often told, you know, they, you need to work on yourself, but nobody really knows what that means and nobody really explains what that looks like. So in this, in the context of this study, there were 22 individuals who clearly engaged in a desistance narrative. So who made a conscious decision to give up crime. This wasn't an age effect or uh, a result of having less extensive criminal histories, meaning that um, people didn't engage in the desistance narrative just because they got older and aged out of crime um, or because they were characterized by less risk factors. So they, they, they didn't distinguish themselves from the rest of the sample with regards to these variables. And as a form of construct validity, um, those who adapted a desistance narrative had on average higher empathy scores emotional empathy, cognitive empathy, and um, positive empathy. They scored higher on the big five personality traits, uh, emotional stability, conscientiousness, agreeableness, et cetera. And they had uh, lower depression scores. So in the book, I identify eight features of the desistance narrative. Um, I'm not going to go through all of them today, but I'm, I'm just gonna highlight four of the most um, salient ones. So the first feature of the desistance narrative, we see that individuals who achieve positive transformation in prison make a conscious decision to confront their suffering and to extract some positive outcome out of painful and traumatic experiences. So if we look at the different ways in which people can adjust to a crisis, there is survival, which is the most, the, the most basic mode, right? It essentially means just to continue to exist. Coping occurs when um, people deal with and attempt to overcome specific problems, specific challenges. So that tends to be a more targeted form of adjustment. Adaptation refers to an individual who just modifies himself or herself so that they may be more fit for the environment to which they're, uh, to which they're exposed. So we'll see in a little bit how adaptation to the prison setting can actually be uh, problematic and detrimental to um, reintegration. And then there's resilience, which refers to reverting back to an original state, to the state which, in which they were prior to exposure to the crisis. None of these terms were adequately reflecting what I was observing in the narratives of the men. There was something else going on. The men were not just going back to where they were. Um, the men who, who, who engage in a desistance narrative, they were actually using adversity and trauma as a springboard for positive change, as an opportunity to learn, to heal, to grow, and in their own words, to become a stronger man. And this refers both to pre-prison and prison adversities. So the, the dominant theoretical framework uh, of the research uh, is adversarial growth. You've probably heard of it. It's also been referred to as uh, post-traumatic growth or thriving. Um, I prefer the term adversarial growth because some adverse life events uh, are challenging, but they're not necessarily regarded as being traumatic. So this was a, a little broader. And so, um, in the book, I also make the parallel to, to the lotus flower, which is uh, borrowed from the, the Buddhist tradition. 
it's a symbol of growth in the face of adversity and, and suffering. So um, Buddhists say that the, the lotus flower grows in muddy water and you know the muddier the water, the thicker the mud, uh, the more beautiful the flower emerges. So this seemed to be a fitting analogy. And in the desistance narrative, there was a strong willingness to tackle emotional wounds, to dive deep into an exploration of the profound state of suffering. I completely understand why some people didn't engage in this process, especially given the extensive histories of abuse and trauma that some of these individuals were struggling with. Um, so it really required an inordinate amount of motivation to actually do this kind of work. The second feature of the desistance narrative uh, pertains to responsibility. So desisting individuals take stock of their part of responsibility in the suffering caused both to others and to themselves over the course of their lives. So there's a shift away from the victim position. There's a shift away from um, blaming others for one's problems. And this was actually very empowering for them because it, it enabled them to regain control of their own narrative. Um, they were able to acknowledge injustice, but they were also assuming responsibility for their own actions. So in a conversation with one of the participants, Michelle here, we're discussing uh, the fact that many of the prisoners were blaming um, the directors of the facility for their inability to sort of make progress. And so Michelle says, it's not them who put me in prison. In prison, I went because I did stupidities. I wasn't walking down the street and then the police said, oh, look, he looks like a nice guy. Come, let's put him in jail. That's not life. You have to take responsibility for what you do in life. I did stupidities and I pay. A third element um, in the desistance narrative, change and growth efforts rely on factors that are within the control of the individual. So when there's excessive dependence on social relationships and other external factors, this provides a shaky foundation for stable long-term change. This is not to say that social bonds are not important. Um, this is not to say that programs are not important. These things are extremely important in supporting individuals in their process of, of, of change and progress towards desistance from crime. They are most helpful, however, when people use it sort of as a hook for change in the words of Peggy Giordano and her colleagues, when they're used to stimulate some form of internal change. There were some individuals who were solely dependent on these external things, right? So they were waiting for a, a desirable program to come to the prison. They were waiting for the staff to come towards them. They were incredibly reliant um, on, on the people around them just to, to make it on a day-to-day -day basis. And now if those factors remain in place, it's not a problem. Of course, they can remain, um, they can remain on that path. They can, uh, they can continue to make progress. But these are, uh, these are things that are out of, out of our control, right? So um, that's what I mean by the shaky foundation. And I'd like to give the example of Jacques. Um, I met him, when I met him in 2013, he was just about to be released. And we met again in 2016 when he was released. And then we met a few times again um, out in the community uh, when I, every time I've gone to Paris. So he, um, he had a number of risk factors for recidivism. He had a history of addiction. He had engaged in sexual assault. Uh, he had a, a very extensive criminal history. And his whole life, he lacked strong social bonds. He never really had a, a strong relationship with his family. He had been placed in, in uh, juvenile detention centers from a young age. So this lack of strong social bonds was a, a risk factor for him in youth but it became a tool for positive change with age because it compelled him to rely on himself. So he's, he explained, you know, I had, to, I had to mourn my family. I think that was pivotal for me. Um, so he acknowledges that it's important, uh, but he says, I had to go without for so many years. It took me a long time to mourn, to say, well, they're not there. I need to go on without. So would, would Jacques have made progress on the path of desistance earlier had he had the appropriate social bonds? Maybe it's, it's very possible, right? But he could have also continued down this path of, I have nobody to help me and, and nobody's, you know, I, I can't do it on my own. But he, there, in his last incarceration, something happened and he shifted, um, 
he shifted that, that, that way of thinking. I also want to highlight uh, another element in Jacques' discourse, which was common to, uh, this was a redundant theme in the discourse of the men, that positive growth is achieved in spite of the prison setting, not because the environment promotes this process, right? So Jacques says here, it's not prison that prepares for release. Preparing for release, it's at the will of each person. And I heard this quite a lot. The, the work that, that when people are actually working on themselves and, and trying to address the issues that may have led them to prison, oftentimes they do it on their own in their cell at night, um, not so much with the help of the facility or the staff. And the last feature of the desistance narrative I wanna, I wanna raise pertains to the, um, the timing of change. So individuals who are committed to positive growth don't postpone the process of transformation to after release. The point of change is anchored in the present despite seemingly impossible circumstances for transformation and growth. So in the desistance narrative, you see this conscious effort to make constructive use of time in prison. There is a deliberate decision to find meaning to one's life and to the time spent in prison through various means. This, this will mean different things to different people. For some, it will be religion, spirituality, work, education, yoga, um, martial arts, painting. It's, it, it, it really varied. There's not one thing that works for everybody. But the point was that when the people discovered what they were really uh, passionate about, it gave them a reason to wake up in the morning and to invest in something and to really give meaning to their lives, even though they were um, in prison. There was also strong reflection on the factors um, that may have led uh, to, their, to, to the offending, right? So I'm not trying to paint a biased portrait of these, of these men. Some of them had committed extremely brutal crimes. Um, and so to think about the harm that they had caused, especially to the families of their victim was, was part of that. Uh, that was an important part of this reflection. And the perceived point of change is in the present, no matter how challenging and no matter how unsupportive the environment might be. So this is where prison makes it difficult to do this because the prison environment is often very incompatible with the outside world. And when it's so incompatible with the outside world, it provides justification to delay those efforts to achieve positive transformation. So some individuals postpone this reflection process because prison life is not regarded as real life. So there were two main narratives that emerged here. The belief that they will be different people on the outside, just miraculously by virtue of leaving um, the, the building of prison. Uh, and there was also a slight tendency to, for some individuals to idealize life on the outside, thinking that the minute they stepped out of there, life would be great and all the problems would vanish. Um, of course, it's not so simple, especially when people are carrying a lot of heavy burdens from their past, even prior to incarceration. And the second narrative is, who we are in prison is who we will be on the outside. So whoever I want to be when I leave here, um, I have to work on that and, and uh, be that person right here. The incompatibilities between prison and the outside world are countless. Um, I just want to highlight one example here in my conversation with Albert. So I asked him how he coped during the most challenging periods. Um, and he says, well, I yelled because in prison, that's the only way to get heard. So I yelled. I almost threatened to go up on the roof or do something stupid to get some work. And I asked him if that was effective. And he says, unfortunately, yes, it worked because it was the norm. Those who don't yell, we don't hear them. And those who yell, well, you have to give them work. Otherwise, we will become mean. It's always a power struggle. It's the opposite of what should be happening. Stay calm and you will get work, but instead you yell and you get work. So there are a number of attitudes and behaviors that people adopt on the inside just to survive, just to, um, to, to satisfy their basic needs, which are completely unacceptable um, on, the, on the outside. And we just assume that that's a switch that people can turn off the second they leave prison, which is unrealistic, especially for people who have spent um, decades in prison. 
I'd like to shift for a minute um, and talk about some of the structural impediments to the, to the process of positive growth and discuss some of the unique challenges of individuals belonging to historically marginalized groups. And I'm gonna draw on the case of Yassin here. But before I do, I'd like to provide a little bit of background information. So the French uh, government doesn't publish statistics on the ethnic background of prisoners. So I can't comment with certainty on the overrepresentation of any particular cultural group in the prison system. Um, since 1990, electronic data collected by the government don't identify uh, racial and ethnic categories um, like many other European nations. And this is due to the importance granted to secularism and so-called colorblindness in France. In 2013, French politicians voted to remove the word race from legal texts. So as strange as this may seem to us, you can have discussions of slavery and colonialism without directly addressing the issue of race and ethnicity. And France has a complex history with its North African population, um, which I detail in the book. And we've also witnessed some of it in the last decades, watching uh, some of the riots in the suburbs of major cities in France. The Algerian and North African uh, immigration experience in France was very different from the immigration experience of other Europeans who often benefited from bilateral agreements between their government and, uh, and the French government, which wasn't the case for Algerians. The French example is important because it's not unique. So the North African experience in France can be paralleled to the African-American experience here in the US, to the Aboriginal experience in Australia and in Canada, um, to the Black and Asian experience in the UK, and the list goes on. So this is all relevant to desistance and reintegration, as I'll demonstrate now through the example of Yassine. So Yassine and I, when we met in 2013, he was in the facility, he was struggling. Um, he was getting in frequent altercations with senior members of staff, and he was being sanctioned for his behavior often. When we met in 2016, he had been released a few months prior to that. Um, he was struggling to reconnect with his family. He was struggling in his relationship with his girlfriend um, and he was still unemployed. So we met in a city, he was living with his family in a city a few hours away from uh, Paris. He felt uncomfortable walking with me. We were trying to, to find a quiet cafe to conduct the interview. He felt that people were staring at us. Um, and so you get a little bit of sense here of this chronic feeling of social exclusion. So he says, try to imagine each time when you walk by, you scare someone just because of your appearance. But it's disgusting. It's disgusting because you can't, I don't know, I don't want to live by spreading fear all the time, honestly. The atmosphere is loathsome. It doesn't help to reconstruct yourself. This is a, an expression that many prisoners use, right? So to reconstruct yourself, the process of reconstruction. And it's sickening because you can't just go towards someone serenely, objectively. You're restricted and you have to be apologetic when you want to ask for information or something. So clearly, we're not talking about reintegration here, right? This is an individual who never felt integrated in society in the first place. And he was born in France. This is the country where he was uh, born and raised. And his experience is not unique. Many other North Africans in the sample described a similar experience. And they described this sort of love-hate relationship with the state. Love because they were yearning to be accepted and, so, and also this uh, resentment for being treated as second-rate citizens. The time that, around the time that Yassin was released was, uh, was around that same period where they were, there were the coordinated attacks, terrorist attacks in Paris. So at this point, he's dealing with this double stigma. First of all, there's his status as a former prisoner um, and also his North African background. So he explains, you know, even going to the bakery in the morning, people are looking at him with suspicion and doubt. Um, and, and just the difficulty in having to, um, to, to, to deal with this. So whenever terrorism, uh, acts of terrorism occur on French soil, this really reinforces the social marginalization of its, um, of its Muslim population. Those are periods where the anti-Muslim sentiment is stronger. When I asked him um, what motivates him to get involved, to, to not to get involved in the activities that led him to prison, namely uh, robbery. 
So he says, me today, what would motivate me to go look for work? It's if I had a mouth to feed, a fridge to fill, a wife to love. I dream of having kids because today, who besides your own child can, like I was saying, truly love you, you understand? Today you have a child, your child, he sees you as God. There's only him who will value you despite your faults, despite your appearance, despite what you are. Yassin was dissatisfied with every relationship um, in his life because they expected him to listen. His sister wanted to talk to him about her problems with her husband. They were expecting him to be supportive and he just had very little to give. He really needed somebody to take care of him. And so it's clear here through what he's saying how the cycle continues. You have somebody who's experienced emotional deprivation who wants to have children to fulfill those needs. But that child's gonna look to his father to have those needs met, uh, but his father is not, doesn't necessarily have, he doesn't have it in him to, to give that child um, the emotional attention that he needs. And so it's clear to see how the cycle continues. Developmental criminologists talk about the intergenerational transmission of crime, right? But it's not crime that's being passed on from generation to generation. It's the residual effects of emotional deprivation and trauma. Yassin had also been um, victim of sexual abuse when he was younger, an issue that had remained unresolved. And so this is not a genetic process. It's not a cultural issue, right? All this to say that positive transformation and redemption in prison and after prison are possible, but they require an extraordinary amount of motivation of willpower and resilience. There are enormous challenges associated with this process, both in prisons and in the reintegration process. And it's not right that we make it so difficult for people to build a path towards redemption. There's a number of issues that I like to discuss. I think these are issues that need to be um, further explored in criminology. Um, in the book, I address the concept of a punitive of a non-punitive prison. And then I discuss the attributes of a prison model that would be conducive to positive growth and desistance from crime. And some of my European colleagues have rightfully pointed out, you know, is there such a thing as a non-punitive prison? is in prison by nature a punitive institution, right? So in my mind, a non-punitive prison is a prison where the deprivation of liberty is sufficient punishment. There is no need or benefit to gain from inflicting additional punitive measures in prison. These include um, exposure to abuse and violence, untenable physical conditions, excessively rigid rules, or uh, additional obstacles uh, in maintaining contact with family members. To this day, I have not heard a single account of the incarceration experience that's highlighted the benefits of the repressive and punitive dimensions of prison. Beyond the accounts of, of the participants, even as an observation. So when I couldn't complete the interview in one sitting and we had to meet on several occasions, um, sometimes they would come straight from the disciplinary quarter where they were placed in solitary. They were always angrier, more aggressive, less hopeful, less receptive. Um, and the instances that people reported that prison actually had helped them, it was because of exposure to education, to employment, um, interactions with volunteers, religion, spirituality, reflection time, etc. It was never because of the punitive dimensions of prison. It seems that we've taken this punitive model far enough. It's not proven to be terribly effective. It's really time to readjust and change course. And it's timely that uh, Jeremy and Bruce Western published an essay for the Brennan Center last week discussing the need to put an end to this era of punitive excess. And so I'm just really curious to see what leaders will be brave enough to experiment with this reintegrative prison model. We have some, some promising models to inspire us abroad, of course, and also there are some units within prisons here in the US that, um, that, that could certainly uh, inspire our next efforts. The next point I wanna raise is this intersection of structural inequalities and individual responsibility. When I presented uh, these findings in France, a philosopher in the audience um, criticized the desistance paradigm 
because he argued that uh, it still places the burden of change on the individual rather than on the system. And I don't see why these two are mutually exclusive, right? Supporting individuals in their efforts to regain control of their narrative and to assume responsibility for the harm that they cause through their crimes to their victims, their victims' families, their own families, their communities. This for me is not at odds with the fight for larger scale structural change. Large scale systemic change takes time. Um, it doesn't take time to adopt uh, harmful policies, but it takes time to reverse those policies. And I just, I don't have the heart to tell men and women who are incarcerated, uh, sentenced to 10, 20, 30 years life in prison that they should sit patiently and wait for the system to change. And of course, um, until that happens, we need to provide our prisoners with the tools to flourish and to find meaning to their lives in prison. This is to our collective benefit. And not all, all policies, of course, are going to address the root causes of crime. Sometimes we need situational measures to address uh, urgent problems of violence. And what I regard as being the biggest challenge in doing this work is how individuals can thrive in the face of extreme injustice. So in the face of systemic racism, of course, but also in cases involving wrongful convictions um, or in, uh, in non-Western countries, political prisoners, uh, it's difficult to commit to making constructive use of prison time when you're not supposed to be in prison. There's an inconvenient reality for all of us, I think, is how do we help those individuals who've caused a great deal of harm, but who express the intent to persist in crime and violence? Um, I don't have the answer to this question. What I do know is that they are a minority of all prisoners. The prisoners who actually pose a threat to public safety are a minute proportion of all prisoners. And so it doesn't make sense to craft a criminal justice policy on the basis of these exceptional cases. They should be assessed on a case by case basis. And lastly, we need to better measure the desistance process beyond just the absence of failure outcomes. So just um, the absence of recidivism. We don't hear nearly as much about our success stories as we do about the failures of individuals involved in the criminal justice system. So we really need to be more balanced in how we measure positive and negative outcomes. In the study, uh, there are several men who discussed how they were really making genuine efforts to better themselves, but that these were not recognized by the facility staff or administration. So after a while, they just kind of gave up on their efforts. And I refer to this as invisible desistance because it was happening, the change was happening, but because it wasn't recognized and reinforced, uh, people gave up on those efforts. So I think it is more than time that we shift from a perspective of being tough on the so-called criminals to actually being tough on crime, to adopting policies that will allow us to reduce rates of recidivism. And preserving human dignity is crucial to this paradigm shift. The most unproductive and harmful criminal justice policies are those that presume fundamental differences between uh, individuals who've offended the law and those who haven't. Or those who haven't been caught, rather. Viktor Frankl wrote a book in 1946, Man's Search for Meaning, in which he detailed the three years that he spent in concentration camps during World War II. The message of the book was not that concentration camps are an appropriate setting for people to find meaning, meaning to their lives. That would be a ridiculous interpretation. Similarly, this book is by no means an endorsement of prison. It's not an apology for the institution of prison. It's not a call for more prisons. My starting assumption was that prison causes harm. We need fewer and better prisons. Fewer prisons because we desperately need to reduce our reliance on confinement. And better prisons because the men and women who find themselves behind bars are really not in need of punishment beyond the deprivation of their liberties, but they're in desperate need of healing. And ultimately, I strongly believe that every human being has an inherent right to redemption. I think this is one of our most fundamental rights. And even though today I only provided a snapshot of, of the findings from this research, I think they extend far beyond the prison walls and they offer reflections on the human experience of thriving in the face of extreme adversity. 
The accounts of the prisoner in the study have really left me in awe of the strength of the human spirit. And in the last year, we've also witnessed the strength of our collective consciousness and actions. And it's because of these strengths that I am optimistic and eager to see where we're headed next in our personal and systemic reform efforts. Thank you. So let me uh, quickly applaud um, Layla for this uh, important book. And uh, I think it's uh, more important even than you know, uh, because it extends so far beyond uh, the research that you've done and certainly beyond the, the men whom you uh, included in your study uh, and extends far beyond the, the boundaries of, of France. And I want to, and, and so just some closing observations uh, to lift up some of the ways in which I think uh, your, your work is so important. Uh, but first, just to start with a hearty congratulations as a friend, colleague, um, and uh, one, once, once upon a time co-author, uh, just to see that this work has, uh, has taken you to, uh, to this place. Uh, I also thank uh, the Office for the Advancement of Research for this uh, opportunity for me to come back and spend, spend some time uh, at, uh, at the John Jay campus, even if virtually. So uh, I'm going to focus most of my, my remarks, Layla, on the, the last set of uh, observations uh, that you made, uh, because I think you have uh, been brave in taking on some of the orthodoxies of, uh, of the reform movement uh, today and some of the orthodoxies of uh, the current um, still tough on crime uh, 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 ethos uh, of our society. So you put yourself as a good scholar should right in the middle of what your findings suggest. Uh, and uh, that, that's, that's brave, uh, but very important uh, at this moment. And uh, I'll start just by observing, and you and I talked about this once, but the, the title choice of your book and uh, how the idea of, and you just mentioned this, positive growth and redemption in prison to many people just sounds like can't be so. It just can't be so that there's something positive that happens uh, in prison. And by choosing that title and, and doing the research you've done, you've, you have placed yourself in the middle of this debate that, that is raging more now than when you started your research on abolition, on the abolition movement, uh, which basically says that this institution that has done so much harm can't possibly be, uh, it's not preserved, you, you don't promote uh, preserving it for its own sake, but it can't, no good can come from it. So uh, what I really admire in, in this work is that you have gone right into the middle of that debate and said, well, let's talk about the people who are in prison. Let's talk about them as human beings. And as you just alluded to, their resilience and their uh, uh, struggle to, to find meaning and celebrate them uh, for what they've, what they've been able to do. And that's not celebrating an institution, but it's celebrating them. You go even further than that, which I also applaud, which is to say, well, let's, let's also be, be brutally honest about the environment within which they are living uh, and to acknowledge the additional burdens and obstacles placed on their, their search for meaning by that environment and ask ourselves this, this really uh, important question, which is uh, if we moved in the direction of a non punitive prison, and even that's a, a, a sort of oxymoron, your prison by its nature, as you alluded to, is punitive, and, and the way it's, prisons are constructed is even more punitive. But, but how can we imagine a prison that does the, the, the liberty deprivation work that prisons do and take that as a given and also imagine a prison where this sort of uh, exploration and, and thriving uh, is, is made possible and, and whatever obstacles there are to that are removed. So that to me is just a, a challenge that you pose to the moment uh, that we're in where, where the, the, the rallying cry is, is abolition. It's not, let's figure out how to make prisons as non-punitive as they can be. But I want to also celebrate that you've done more than that. And uh, let me see if I can, uh, in, in pretty short order, uh, list what I'm calling uh, Layla's uh, seven heresies. Uh, so you've, you've, you've done some things that have, uh, I think, just challenged a lot of uh, conventional wisdom, both in the academy uh, and in the, in the general public. Uh, so 
I'll, I'll do them pretty quickly so we have time uh, for people to get answers to questions that are that are appearing in the in the uh, in the Q and A uh, section of, of the uh, of the webinar. So first, you 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 place suffering at the center of your analysis, and to me that's just such a profound observation to say that. Uh, it, it, we, we tend to think a lot about sort of social context, upbringing, uh, you know, poverty, and uh, and other you know, important variables. But you just place suffering squarely at the center of an understanding of both the criminal act itself, but also in important ways the process of desistance. And I just think that's a challenge to the way we think about crime, the way we think about. Uh, the, the the way people move out move out of or beyond crime it's not not just a natural process uh, but it really is coming to terms with that suffering uh, and I just applaud you for for that so that's the first heresy that I'll, I'll uh, lift up uh, and it's 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 not it's not a common uh, language uh, and it has profound implications to think about uh, uh, suffering second this idea that uh, that prisons can promote growth we talked about it a bit. Uh, but that the time in prison should be seen as a time to uh, to allow for, not to force, but to allow for uh, and recognize the opportunities uh, for, for personal growth and transformation, which requires dealing with that deep suffering. And and you, you say that you, your subjects at some point said to you they were growing tired of the suffering. It was just they, they had to move beyond it. It wasn't because they were in a program. It wasn't because they'd been in prison for a certain length of time. It wasn't because of some external artificial uh, uh, construct like they, they finally learned a skill or they finally worked on the anger management. It was really that deep personal work that, that allowed for that growth. And yes, that growth in all of the ways that it, it despite all the ways that it can be impeded can also occur uh, within, within prisons. So that, that requires us, as I said, to think about prisons uh, quite differently and what a, I won't say there is a non-punitive prison because there isn't, but what a prison, how can we think about prisons uh, that are, that have minimized their, their punitive uh, uh, regimes, in particular on this, this, this issue you allude to of, uh, of internal discipline and uh, in the way that prisons are managed. So the, the third heresy that uh, Layla has, uh, has laid down here, the gauntlet, gauntlet she's laid down, is to say that desistance requires a what you call a deep dive into getting in touch with and exploring that suffering. And sometimes, and I'm guilty of this, my own thinking about desistance, it, it's the way we measure desistance is by looking at, at events. Uh, somebody got married, desistance. Somebody, so the life course criminology often focuses on things that are observable. And we say, ah, we, we figured it out. There was that moment where something happened. Uh, and that becomes the, 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 the sort of signpost on the, on the journey towards assistance. You say, no, 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 no. If the, if the core reality that, that has caused the, the criminal behavior and the, uh, and the uh, sort of antisocial behavior and other types of uh, problematic uh, behavior is suffering, then desistance has to require that deep dive to explore the suffering, and uh, your 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 research and your and your subjects have have brought that home just just powerfully. Uh, that uh, it, eventually some the, the pain is too much, and somebody has to in order to avoid that pain, uh, confront that pain uh, directly. Uh, a question we want to ask later is what can prisons do, and uh, we'll come to that in a second. Uh, to help to, uh, facilitate that sort of uh, introspection, because the other heresy that you that you lay down here is that what is required here is is acts of the individual rather than institutional support. So that really negates the the, the challenge that I just articulated, which is how can prisons help? I think you would ask them to help, but the the, the core uh, insight that you bring to us is that this is is a matter of individual action. It's not something that is a program. It's not something that uh, prisons can necessarily do uh, themselves uh, and can't artificially create, uh, but it requires that, uh, that uh, individual uh, determination, which is so powerful. Uh, the next uh, of Layla's heresies uh, challenges, I'll put it that way, that's perhaps a little more polite, um, 
and this one I, I think is just is going to catch some of your readers a little bit uh, unawares, which is you, you talk about how it's not enough to have a sense of injustice, although many of your subjects did, and many people in prison do, that there's, there's been injustice in the world, there's racism, there's ways in which uh, the, the system has treated people badly, uh, people who have been innocent uh, have a different sense of injustice, and you have one of those in your sample. Uh, so yes, lots of injustice in the world. Uh, but you also say, and it's a real challenge to our thinking, that if, there, if that sense of injustice uh, metastasizes uh, into anger and hatred, uh, that may actually get in the way of maybe an obstacle to the system. So how to come to terms, not just with the suffering and with the pain and whatever has been in, the, in your sample, the ways in which people have experienced harm over the years, uh, but how to, how, to, how, to, how to wrestle with it and have perspective on the injustice that might be present in somebody's life in order to, to, uh, to, to do the work uh, that needs to be done. And then your, your uh, last two points, uh, heresies, which you just alluded to, are this one that I think is so important. Uh, waiting for the system to change is just, just uh, it, it's cruel and it's inhuman and it uh, denies the, uh, the uh, human potential and, and the, the human dignity and human worth of people who are in prison. Yes, we should be promoting change. Yes, we should have, as, as you said, somewhere fewer and better prisons. We definitely need to have fewer people in prison. Uh, I don't know what the irreducible minimum is, but and we're so far from it, it's just hard to even think that we might move in that direction. Uh, but to wait for the system to change and to say, therefore, we're not going, we don't want to prop up a system of prisons because of the ways in which uh, uh, prisons are cruel and, and, and human. Uh, that's that's a mistake. That's just a a a a, a denial of the value of uh, of our fellow human beings who are in prison. And rather, we should be uh, taking research like yours, and maybe some days this will be replicated in the U.S. And just say, look what look what look look what's possible uh, in the lives of of those of our uh, fellow citizens who are behind bars. Uh, if only we uh, we recognize their potential for change, their desire to change, and didn't didn't. Uh, put so few, didn't put so many obstacles uh, in their way. Um, so the the uh, this this way in which, and I'll end on this. You 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 uh, very respectfully take on the the abolition position uh, by saying, as a reality, prisons maybe will always be with us, but they'll certainly be with us for a long time. Uh, abolition might be a wonderful goal. Uh, you don't. Uh, take this on frontally to say who should, in, in a normal sense, be in prison. That's beyond the scope of your research. But if they're to be prisons, uh, then there should be fewer of them. They should, they should be better. And those prisons should recognize the humanity of people incarcerated. Uh, they should recognize the opportunity uh, and promote the opportunity for change. Uh, maybe there are more ways that, that you, can, you can elaborate upon this point. Uh, but the desistance, if that's the goal, and realization of human potential is always the goal in, in any public policy, uh, along with equity and uh, uh, recognizing the, uh, the desire to make things better uh, and to uh, acknowledge the harms that have been caused, uh, then, uh, then we, we really need to reimagine prisons, as hard as that might be to even say those words. So if, uh, if a lotus blossoms better in the mud, we've got a lot of mud, uh, and hopefully we'll have some beautiful uh, lotus blossoms uh, that will come in the future. And I really, really commend you uh, for for your work in this this magisterial book. It's just great. Thank you so much, Jeremy. Thank you. Um, I mean, there there are a lot of points that you raised. I don't know if we want to get to the questions, maybe. Uh, let's see. Uh, is imprisoned by its very nature punitive because of the artificial? Yes, it is by nature punitive. So I, I think I do think, uh, uh, Marty. I don't think that a non-punitive prison is the necessarily the best uh, term. Reintegrative prison, maybe. Um, so, like I said, for me, the we don't need to tack on all these extra punitive measures other than depriving somebody of their of their liberties. So that's uh, that was my. Uh, that was my perspective on it. But yeah, I, I absolutely agree that uh, the term probably needs to be revised. Um, so 
So I'm aware of the example of some of the Western European and Scandinavian prisons, but suggest that even there, some level of antisocial behavior exists uh, beneath the surface. You mean uh, in prison? I presume you mean in prison. Um, I mean, one of the reasons why we just, Jeremy just mentioned the abolitionist approach. One, one of the reasons also why I'm not an abolitionist is that I've sat across people who have point blank told me that they were going to be released and go and engage in, extreme, in acts of extreme violence. So that those individuals also, we, we don't like acknowledging this, right? But they do exist. There are very few of them. Again, it doesn't make sense to, um, to, to make any assumptions about prisoners as a whole based on this minority, but they do exist. And yet there are individuals who uh, continue to be committed to engage in violence. And we wouldn't be, the person should not just be um, released with no conditions when they're making uh, obvious threats. So do they need to be placed in solitary 23 hours a day? Do they need to be punished in addition from their removal from society? That's the part where uh, I don't agree. And I, I think it's actually counterproductive. Uh, thank you. Say more about the role of gender and the findings, to what extent they're applicable to women and gender non-conforming persons in prison. That's a great question, Sam. Um, I, I don't, that's a good question. I don't have an answer to it. Uh, this, so this study is, it was a qualitative study largely. As I said, initially it was meant to be a, a quantitative study, ended up being a qualitative study. And because this was largely exploratory, I would say, because we don't know much about the process of desistance from crime in prison, I think it needs to be, uh, as Jeremy said, replicated um, in, in different cultural contexts. And also I think now with the results that I have about the, what the desistance narrative looks like, to build a scale that can actually be validated and tested. So I think that's that's pretty important because this is informative, but again, based on a small sample. So in order to make gen broad generalizations, uh, it, it definitely needs to be tested with a larger sample. It's really my hope that um, prisons can become more open to research, which has been a bit of a challenge. And I always remember some things that the director of the prison said to me where I was doing my research. Um, they were cleaning the front of the prison, the, en the entrance. And he said, you know, uh, a prison is paid for with taxpayer dollars. So I treat it uh, the same way that you would treat an airport, a public institution, right? So it has to be, it has to remain clean because it belongs to the public in a sense. Um, and so I hope that some of that attitude can, can rub off here um, and that we, we have more access to and more transparency with our, with our prisons. How can we respond to crime without deprivation of liberty? Yeah, that's, I, I don't know that that's possible, um, but I don't, I think we, we, we should use deprivation of liberty as a last recourse, whereas that's not what we're doing right now, right? We're, we're de depriving people of their freedom when it's not necessary to do that. And I think there are some extreme cases where, uh, where that is necessary, unfortunately. Uh, pushback on the slide where you can find the book. Yeah, it's, uh, it's routledge.com. Um, and if you wanted the, the discount code, I believe it's FLR40. Yeah, there it is. Um, it's curious about any patterns unfold related to the respondent age. So the participant age, you mean? So it's interesting, uh, I expected uh, individuals who engage in a desistance narrative to be older. Like you just assume that people are aging out of crime, they're becoming more mature, they're, um, they've had they've had more experience, or if they've spent a, lot, a long time in prison at some point, you know, they just grow tired of it. But uh, actually I had quite a few younger participants who, who, had, uh, who had adhered to a desistance narrative. So there wasn't really any um, any, they, the, those who adopted the desistance narrative didn't distinguish themselves from the rest of the sample in terms of age or in terms of criminal history characteristics. Thank you, Bianca. Where do white collar criminals fit in these paradigms? Great question. Um, I did not have any white collar criminals in my sample. So, um, as I said, this prison was a prison that housed a lot of people um, 
that uh, that had committed particularly violent crimes. So I didn't have any white collar. But that's that's actually a great question. Whether this um, this framework would apply to uh, white collar criminals? Thank you, Karen. I'll think about that. So our similarity between process of growth and change for prisoners and the 12 step program of alcoholic um, anonymous, is there a commonality there? Yeah, I'm not, I mean, I'm not fully familiar with the, the, the 12 step program, um, but really any, any kind of intervention or any kind of um, programmatic suggestion that suggests anything about reflection Right. Uh, anything about uh, taking assuming responsibility. I know that's probably part of the 12 step program, assuming responsibility for the harm caused. Um, that's likely that's the, they, they come. They likely share these common features. What other substitution for prison do you think should exist for extreme cases where criminals need to be in? Great question. Um, so our colleague at Manhattan College, Andrew Scott Nicky, talks about how we shouldn't have prisons, we should have facilities for care. Um, it's where people, that's really what people need. People really don't need any additional um, uh, time in prison, right? So I don't know what's next for us. I don't know if we're gonna have an institution that's gonna substitute prison. I don't know if it's just that, as Jeremy said, we're just gonna reimagine our prisons and shift the focus. What's very clear is that the, the, what Jeremy and Bruce refer to as the era of punitive excess, it just, it hasn't worked. It has not been effective. The, puni the, the extra punitive measures that we take with, with people who find themselves behind bars, just even if we put the moral argument aside, it's just not been effective. Um, so I, I don't know if it's gonna be a substitute for prison or just a, a new, uh, a new sort of way of reimagining what our prisons will look like and whether the term prison will even be appropriate anymore, right? Should we just change the name and call it something else once we actually are capable of making that paradigm shift? Thank you, Amy. Have uh, prisons in France adopted trauma-informed practices with their institutions? Any evaluation of such practices there in the United States? Um, that's a it's a really good question, Evan. Um, so uh, over the course of my study, I, I wasn't hearing any um, feedback about real meaningful interventions. So most of the programs that were being offered uh, revolved around education. Um, there was very limited resources in addressing trauma. So there were a few, there was a group of, of prisoners who had been convicted of, of sex offenses and they themselves organized their own group where they were um, getting together and talking. But um, in terms of interventions that were specifically trauma focused and uh, not that I heard of. So that was, I think one of the concerns of the prisoners is that everything was about just occupying your time, keeping busy, um, you know, just because that's also better for, for the facility. If people are busy, then they, there's less opportunities to get in trouble. But there wasn't that many uh, interventions and programs that were actually aiming to address trauma. How do I think my own positionality, gender, foreign accent, outsiders shaped the findings? Um, great question. So it did, I think uh, the fact that I, I'm a woman, obviously I think uh, increased the number of participants in the study. The fact that I had a French Canadian accent dissipated any doubt of whether I was a mole for the government. Um, and also my Middle Eastern background, I think helped uh, with a lot of prisoners who became more trusting of me. It also helped that once a few of the prisoners met with me and we, uh, we, we conducted the interview, they spread the word in the facility. Um, and so I, there was part, one prisoner in particular who was really influential in the facility and he met with me and he trusted me. And so he spread the word and, um, and it was easier to, to get more participants then. But I think the experience might've been quite different if I was a man. Um, they were opening up to me about really sensitive uh, past trauma that perhaps they wouldn't open up with somebody uh, with, with a, a male researcher. Um, and so uh, it definitely played a role. I think, I think it affected it in a good way in terms of increased participation and increased openness. 
um, but there might be uh, five minutes left. Okay, but uh, there, there's definitely some 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 form of bias that's introduced because of the characteristics of the researcher, certainly. Since education and facility interventions are needed as alternatives to prison, how can we cover the financial needs for those interventions? Prison is expensive. Um, prison is very expensive. So if we send fewer people to prison, we can uh, divert some of those funds into, uh, into more preventive programs. Would you like to conduct the same can research? I ask, can can, can, Please, can I ask one last question? Go Lula? ahead. Uh, I'm wondering if, if you've thought about uh, applying this, both this method and your findings beyond the prison setting for people who are you know, involved in the criminal justice system and convicted in crimes, but not sentenced to prison. You know, desistance is, is you know, a, you know, should be a, a wider base phenomenon. Um, and what would it look like if you did the study for people who are under supervision or, or had no uh, serious sanction? Yeah, so we, that's another great question. Uh, we, we've actually been really fortunate with my colleague at Fortune Society, Dr. Ronald Day. We just received funding from Arnold Ventures to examine the process of desistance from crime in the context of parole. So there's certainly some of these questions that are going to be, that we're going to be used to examine how, what the process of desistance from crime looks like as people are leaving prisons. But even if people are not under parole, right? Any alternatives to incarceration, probation, or I'll go even wider. I think the, the, the ramifications of these findings extend far beyond just the criminal justice system. People struggle with uh, social exclusion, people struggle with marginalization, poverty, all these issues. And I think a lot of the strategies that are used by the prisoners are definitely relevant for any context of extreme adversity. Do we have more time? Should I keep going? Do I, uh, would you like to conduct the same research again in the future? And if you do, what findings do you hope to find? Um, I'm not hoping for any findings. I really just follow the data, but I, I do hope that I can conduct this research here in the US. I hope that, um, that desistance from crime and reintegration uh, is a priority of, of the Department of Corrections. I think it's an incredibly important topic because, you know, Jeremy and I wrote about this in the article we published a few years ago. Long term prisoners and individuals serving life sentences, there's such a stabilizing force inside of the facility. So we really have a tremendous amount to gain from their well being. We have a tremendous amount to gain by investing in their growth. Um, and so uh, I, I really do hope that I'll be able to do that here in the US. Uh, I didn't get a chance to hear if the question was asked, have there been any positive updates on those interviewed after their release? So since COVID, I haven't been able to go back to France. Um, but prior to that, even after 2016, um, I was, I, I, whenever I go back, I would meet up with the men who had been released. And many of them, when they're released, they actually, they email me, they, uh, they want to meet up when I go to France. So it's also great for them because, you know, they're saying nobody, nobody's been following us up ever. So they're like, you're, you're watching us change. And, and a few of them ask, like, can we please stay in touch? Like, I just want to see, do you think I've changed since last time? You know, what's happened? Do you think I'm different? So people are really um, hungry for a kind of follow-up, some kind of assessment that would allow them to sort of check in and see how they've changed over time. So once uh, travel is open again, I definitely plan on going back and continue, continuing the interviews. And I think... Are we out of time, Dan? We are out of time, yes. Thank you, Layla. Thank you, Thank Jeremy. You. It's been a pleasure. It's really great to have you with us. And hopefully the next time we do this, we can do it in person on John Jay's campus. I look forward to seeing you all there very soon. Thank you, Dan. Jeremy, thank you so much. And thank you all for being great. here. Yeah, great. Bye. Take care. Congratulations. Thank you. Well...